Welcome. Yeah. Greetings. I'm Daniel Jacobson. I'm director of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization and a professor of philosophy here at CU Boulder. Um, the Benson Center, our mission is to promote the study of Western civilization and to increase intellectual and political diversity on campus. Uh, tonight, I'm going to introduce you to our new, new-ish now, uh, visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy, Brandon Wormke. Um, he's, he's here for the term. He was a sabbatical scholar for us last, last year. He's here um, working on a book on conservatism. Um, his, he has written a book, Moral Grandstanding, on the use and abuse of moral talk with Justin Tosi, who's a sabbatical fellow this term at the center. Um, it's excellent work. I recommend it to you. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce Brandon. Thanks, uh, thank you, Professor Jacobson. Uh, good evening and welcome to campus. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to moderate tonight's event. I'm looking forward to a robust, civil, and fruitful exchange of ideas. In its perennial search for truth and understanding, a university can fulfill its mission only when it welcomes conversations about a diversity of perspectives. Tonight, the Benson Center is proud to contribute to, con to, to such a conversation. We are not starting the conversation this evening, nor are we ending it, but we're glad you are here to be a part of it. Now, before I introduce tonight's guest, let me say a few words about our plan for this evening. Our speaker tonight is, as you know, Dr. Yoram Hazoni. After his 45-minute lecture, Dr. Hazoni will join me for a short conversation. Then we will turn to questions from the audience. Now, given the size of the venue and the turnout for the event, um, both here and online, the Office of Communications on campus has suggested that we proceed with Q&A in the following way. On the screens, <laughs> hopefully on the screens, okay, there we go. On the screens, uh, on the sides and in front, uh, you will see a QR code. If you open your phone camera and point it at the QR code, and there's a, there'll come up a little link, if you click that link, you'll be taken to a Google forum where throughout the evening, you can submit your questions electronically. If you are watching online, you will see a link to submit questions as well. Those questions will be sent to me on that iPad over there, and uh, I can ask those questions for you. I'll, my promise is I'm going to try to get through as many questions as possible in our time together. Uh, and although I encourage you to be brief, I'm sure I also speak for Dr. Hazoni when I say uh, I absolutely welcome your critical and challenging questions. Our guest this evening is Dr. Yoram Hazoni. Dr. Hazoni is an Israeli philosopher, political theorist, and author. He serves as president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem and as chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation. Dr. Hazoni took his PhD in political theory from Rutgers University and is the author of five books, perhaps most relevant to this evening, his 2000 book, The Jewish State, The Struggle for Israel's Soul, and his 2018 book, The Virtue of Nationalism. Tonight, he defends Israeli nationalism. Would you please join me in welcoming to campus Dr. Yoram Hazon. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be taking part in the work of this important center, and uh, allow me to express my gratitude to, uh, to Dan and Brandon, Justin, and Alexandra, uh, who worked to make this evening and so many other e evenings like this possible. I I've been asked to talk about Israeli nationalism, and I think everybody who is involved in uh, deciding that that should be our topic for tonight uh, was, was and is keenly aware that uh, Israeli nationalism is not you know, some kind of uh, musty academic to topic without relevance 
to current affairs right now. Um, we are in a time of war. Uh, tempers are uh, high on all sides. And um, all sorts of people think that, you know, that they have very good reasons for their tempers to be high. I respect everybody's uh, opinions on different subjects, but I, I should emphasize at the beginning that I, I'm not an impartial observer of the subject that we're talking about. Uh, I not only uh, live in Israel with my wife and have uh, ra raised my children there, um, I'm uh, fifth generation Israeli, even though my accent sounds like it's from New Jersey, this is an illusion, don't pay no attention to that. <laughs> Um, and uh, I am uh, not quite directly involved in the war, uh, but I have two sons who've been on the front lines uh, for, for a lot of the last few months. I have three nephews who've been on the front lines for a lot of the last few months. I have uh, almost everybody my age has children uh, in the military among my friends. Um, my wife and I uh, attended the funeral of uh, the oldest son of a close of close friends of 30 years uh, who died in combat. And uh, I have a uh, family relation who is a hostage in in Gaza. So you know I'll do my best to uh, to express my opinions uh, with an appropriate leaving appropriate space for people who disagree. Um, I, I think that's a minimum that every speaker should should do. But at the same time, as I say, um, these are uh, subjects that are not only intellectually interesting, but also also emotionally crucial to me and to many others. And uh, I look forward to a, uh, a respectful exchange with those of you who are sympathetic to my views and with those of you who are not. So uh, let's... Let's begin, I think, you know, you can't talk about Israeli nationalism without talking about nationalism. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with um, uh, just asking, you know, what is nationalism and why would anybody want to be a nationalist? The um, uh, nationalism that I grew up with in my home and which I'll be defending tonight I will define in the following way. Nationalism is a principled standpoint that regards the world as governed best when many nations can chart their own independent course, cultivating their own traditions, pursuing their own interests with as little as possible interference uh, on the part of others. And uh, this concept of nationalism, of a a world of independent nations is one that has a very, very long history. Uh, usually nationalism, when it's being discussed by people who have at least a little bit of sympathy for it, understand that nationalism has for a very, very long time been understood to be the opposite or kind of a... Uh, a, a, um, uh, a d in dialectical opposition let's just say, in opposition to imperialism. Okay, th there is an ideal um, which also has an extremely long, it's thousands of years of, of history behind it. There is an ideal which says, look, wars and famines and disease and suffering are to a very large extent, uh, to a very great extent, happen to human beings because of conflicts among independent tribes, independent nations, which can't restrain themselves, and, and so they, they, they kill one another. And a very old proposal for how to solve that problem is by building an empire. If you go, you know, if you dig in the Middle East, um, you, you pull things out of the ground from thousands of years ago, the kind of ideology that you come across, political, political ideas that motivated uh, the, the Babylonian Empire and the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptian Empire and the Persian Empire and so on, the kinds of ideas that motivated them, uh, you might even recognize them. There's always uh, a god who speaks to uh, the king of a particular nation and commands him to uh, go out and conquer the four corners of the earth. 
Why? Well, the, the argument is because in conquering all of the nations of the earth, the Assyrian ruler or the Babylonian ruler will be able to bring peace and prosperity to mankind. Right? I'm not saying that you know all of these um, extremely violent imperialistic rulers uh, were necessarily just idealistic, but I do think that you have to understand that there is in fact an ideal involved. The ideal is peace and prosperity will come to the world when we put a stop to wars by force. You know, in the history of political ideas, the birth of the, the contrary position, as far as we know historically, uh, certainly um, uh, the, 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 the most important texts, documents from the ancient world uh, which proposed the alternative, a world of independent nations instead of a world ruled by an empire, are in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, the, the prophets of Israel argue about many different things. They disagree about many different things. But one thing that uh, runs as a, you know, kind of a consensus throughout uh, ancient Israelite texts that, that we have is the view of, of these empires, these world-conquering empires, as being fundamentally evil, right? The, 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 the prophets believe that in order to conquer a different people, to conquer all of these many nations, hundreds of peoples and nations, these empires have no choice but to commit vast acts of bloodshed, oppression toward... Torture. That was the free portion of tonight's entertainment. Uh, we had to pay for this part. So. <laughs> look, I, I, I look forward to getting to the political part of the conversation later. I, just one small comment is that that gentlewoman was not calling for two states living in peace side by side. She was calling for the elimination of the state of Israel. All right, so let's go back to uh, scripture, which um, is understudied in political theory and political philosophy programs. Hopefully someday we'll change that. But one of the central issues is empire or independent nations. The prophets of Israel, they, they take a side. Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, he's speaking, you know, he's he says he's talking to God, creator of heaven and earth, but he is giving the, the, the people of Israel borders. And he says, you're not allowed to cross those borders. You're not allowed to try to conquer the neighbors. Not one inch, he says, of the neighbor's land is going to be for, for Israel. Those other nations, they have their own relationship with God. They have their own ways and their own path. And Israel's supposed to stay behind its borders. Right? This is a new thing in the world. We also find Moses calling on the Israelites to have a king who's chosen from among their brothers. No more foreign rulers. It has to be self-determination. To have prophets from among their brothers, Moses tells us. 
This doesn't mean that Moses doesn't believe there are prophets among the nations. He does believe that the other nations have prophets. But the prophets need to speak for their own, to their own people in their own language with their own understanding. All right, this, this concept of uniting the tribes of Israel around a single, uh, a single polity, an independent polity with its own rulers and its own intellectual life, its own spiritual life, this is an ideal that, first of all, the, the Bible doesn't only apply to, to Israel. We find the prophets talking about other small nations and ho aspiring to see them free as well. And this idea of national freedom, it becomes throughout Western history, you know, th throughout Christian history, which is based on, you know, in part on taking Jewish ideas, in part on Greek and Roman ideas. Throughout West Western history, we, we get to see a... Uh, a seesaw between the Roman ideal of let's bring peace and prosperity to the world by conquering the world and this, this ancient Jewish ideal, which says, no, actually that ideal is wrong. The right thing is independent nations. Allow nations to be free. Each one will go its own way. And if that means that there are wars among nations, then that's a price that it is a price. But it's a price that the prophets are apparently willing to entertain for the sake of this ideal of national freedom. I, you know, somehow I feel like this is not, this is not a conversation. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so a couple, look, a couple more. All right. Ladies, gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? All right. So, look, the point, the, uh, the point that I, I, I think is worth thinking about, worth uh, considering, is that there's all sorts of fascinating ideas that you find in Greek and Roman sources. But this idea of national independence, of national freedom, of one nation under God, this idea is not Greek and it's not Roman. Wherever you see it, when you say the Pledge of Allegiance as, as a kid in an American school, and you, you, you're uh, taught to think in terms of one nation, a unified nation under God, independent from the other nations. This is a, uh, a, 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 biblical, a biblical teaching. It's not, it's not something we get from the Romans. It's the opposite of what we get from the Romans. So I'm not saying that there's no downside to it, but I am saying that we need to understand how this idea of a world of independent nations has shaped us, has shaped our ideals and our intuitions. All right. Let me, at this point, turn specifically to, uh, to the issue of the Jews. Israeli nationalism is Jewish nationalism. It's the result of a, as I'm sure you all know, it's the result of a, a movement that called itself the, the Zionist movement, and the Zionist movement consciously built itself, its, its aspiration to create an independent Jewish state in the land of Israel, consciously built its, uh, its aspirations on a Jewish tradition of, of thousands of years. What's that tradition? Well, first of all, there's the, the tradition that we Jews come from a nation that was destroyed you know, a long time ago, and that Jews were sent into exile. 
right? Part of the Hebrew Bible is th this concept of exile, which appears over and over again. That if, uh, if you are wrestling with the question of, is there a just God? And the prophets wrestled with this. You know, I mean, in the end, they think there is a just God. But, the, but Hebrew scripture is full of wrestling with this question of how could, how could there be a just God who allows horrific things to happen, you know, many horrific things. And one of the central things in Jewish experience is the, uh, the destruction of you know, first the northern kingdom of Israel and then the kingdom of Judah and the exile of uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people who were scattered across the Middle East and who, when they sat by the, you know, sat in Babylon uh, and tried to understand the meaning of this destruction of their country, what they sought was some kind of a way out that would allow God, creator of heaven and earth, to do justice in the end after all that had been experienced. Now, just to be clear, these prophets don't think that the Israelites were righteous. They think that the Israelites failed because they were not righteous, because, because they, they, they did all sorts of terrible things, which are described at great length in the Bible. But if you look at the other side of this, the fact that the Bible is filled with prophetic um, uh, uh, declarations that God will one day take pity on his people and return them to their land. Right? This, this, this is a, a very radical reinterpretation of what history can be. The moment that you, you consider that there's a God who could actually say that hundreds of years from now, maybe thousands of years from now, he's going to reconstitute that nation so that the descendants of that people will, will be able to be free again, will be able to, to, to walk, as Jeremiah says, to, you know, to, to revel in the, the song of the bridegroom and the bride in the hills of Judah again after these horrific scenes of, of murder and destruction. Notice that, the, that, that this is... A, a direct connection of the aspiration for a world in which there is some kind of greater justice than what we usually see, a connection between that and what happens in, in history. It's daring. I don't know how many people want to defend it today, but you should at least know that, that, that Jews hand down, have handed down for thousands of years, this prophetic vision of the idea that a nation that's been massacred and destroyed can be brought back to life. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel has this famous, famous prophecy of the dry bones, the Valley of the Dry Bones, if you know it, chapter 37 of Yechezkel, in which the, 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 the prophet is uh, shown by God a, a barren wasteland filled with thousands of, tens of thousands of of, of uh, bodies that have, have, have dried out in the sun and, and, and it's a, a valley of bones and God says to the prophet uh, son of man can these bones live and uh, Ezekiel says how can I know something like this you know can they live it doesn't seem like they can live and in the end God says look the, 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 these are the people of Israel in exile Right. Listen to this original Jewish emotion expressed by the prophet, that to be in exile, to be removed from your land, to be scattered, powerless, wandering the earth, is just, for, for Ezekiel, it, it, is, it is death. And then the prophet looks at these bones, and God tells him, call on the bones, call, call them to come together. And the prophet does that. And then the bones come together and we're told that he sees an exceedingly great host, which are the people of Israel coming back to life after their exile and returning to their land. But this is something that, whether it makes sense to you or not, you can't understand what a Jew is if you don't understand that 
all of us who are in any way connected to the tradition, regardless of our political views or the particular religious view that we have, we have this deep inside of us that God will in the end have mercy upon us. He'll allow the dry bones to come back to life. And we in Israel, this is the, this is the vision that we're raised on. So when people tell you, and you'll often hear, often hear this uh, in academia, that Zionism is a secular movement. Now, I don't want to say that it's not a secular movement in many ways, but I think it's important to understand that when, when, when Jews put together a secular movement, it's not like, you know, like when Christians have a secular movement or, or when Muslims have a secular movement. For Jews, the, for, including the, the, um, the, the, the radicals who led the people of Israel from Europe and from the, the Arab lands to, to reestablish their country, for these Jews, whether they were you know, practicing Orthodox Jews or not, all of them had been raised on these prophecies of the return of the people to Israel, and all of them had some kind of belief in the justice the possible justice of a universe in which the Jews would be able to return to their land. Let's think for a second about Theodor Herzl. Herzl, a, a Jewish journalist in, um, in Vienna, grew up in Budapest. Um, Herzl, uh, in 1896, wrote a book called uh, Der Judenstaat, The Jewish State. He himself was, was you know, certainly not an observant Jew. He was raised, you know, like most Jews, with these legends of, of the Jews will someday uh, return to their land. But for him, the thing that was really crucial about what, what he was experiencing in, in, in Vienna and in Paris in, at the end of the 19th century was something that should be of interest to us today, which is that um, after decades of liberal efforts to give full rights, emancipation, they called it, full rights as citizens to Jews in France, in Austria, in, in most of the countries of Europe, decades and decades of liberal efforts to bring the Jews into full citizenship in these countries to allow them for the first time to be able to, uh, to, to participate in all businesses, in all the arts, in, in the sciences, to take political positions of leadership. Those decades of liberal attempts to make the Jews at home as a part of the nations that they lived in in Europe, Herzl came to the conclusion that they had failed. He and many others were living in a time of exploding anti-Semitism in some, some ways parallel to what we might be seeing now, exploding anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews, the desire to strip the Jews of their rights as citizens, all these wild theories about how the Jews were poisoning and destroying all of the countries that they were living in. And Herzl, I mean, the, the famous thing about Herzl is that he said, look, we can't live here anymore. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to organize an international Jewish Congress, the first Congress of Jews, and we're going to declare our, our purpose of returning to our land, and I'm going to go around to the, to the leaders of nations, and I'm going to sell this idea to them. I'm going to build alliances in order to return the Jews to have any Jew who wants to leave Europe, to leave the, the Middle East, and to return to, to, to their land. So that's all very well known, and it's all, it's all correct. But I think probably most people are not familiar with uh, what, what I think is really the center of Herzl's argument. The heart of Herzl's argument is that not that the, the anti-Semites are threatening the Jews and therefore they need a, a place to flee to, although that was part of his argument, but that's not the heart of it. The heart of the argument is that Herzl, like Max Nordau and many of the other early Zionists, they all believed the following thing. They believed that the spirit of the Jews in Europe had been destroyed. 
that that the Jews in Europe had first been persecuted, but but you know for 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 centuries and centuries, but that that persecution had actually left the spirit of the Jews intact, that the the, the medieval persecutions, Herzl writes, had 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 fallen on people who had some inconceivably great strength, he wrote, that we, liberal Jews, the Jews of emancipation, we've lost the strength that they had. He, he writes about the, the, you know, the, this could also sound familiar to you, the, the, the loss of the capacity to be a strong, proud person standing in the face of adversity taking responsibility for your fate. So Jew, we Jews can't do that anymore. The reason we can't do it is because, because we, we've, we, we've joined all the nations and we do everything we can to, to be the best possible Frenchman and the best possible German and the best possible Englishman. And he says that actually we're humiliating ourselves, we're degrading ourselves because the one thing that, that a Jew really needs in order to be able to be a person that you can admire is for him or her to stand up as a Jew and face adversity and take, take what comes. And so the, the idea, when you read Herzl's descriptions of the state that's coming, I'm sure many people will find this jarring, but he thinks, he thinks the military is crucial crucial. He wants to see Jewish soldiers. He wants to see Jewish officers again. Right? I mean, the, the Zionist movement is complicated. Herzl didn't speak for everybody. There were pacifists. There were all sorts of people. But he does speak and did then and does now still speak for the mainstream of Israeli nationalists, of Zionists, of Jewish nationalists who feel that that coming back to the land, farming the land, living out the prophecies, building homes and cities, all of that is based upon, built upon, predicated upon a change in the character of the Jew who becomes somebody who instead of fleeing you know, into, uh, into liberalism and losing his or her identity, goes back into Jewish identity, as Herzl writes, we're going to retreat back into that fortress and we're never going to let anyone take us out of it again. He's talking about my kids and our neighbor's kids, people who, when the time comes, when the call comes, they step forward and they go to fight. Some of them die. Many of them will die. And by the way, I, this, doesn't, this doesn't mean that, that, there, that uh, Jewish power, Jewish military power, that, that it means we're always good. You know, very often when you have power, you make mistakes. Part of exercising power is knowing that you can do something wrong. You know, it's very easy to be, um, uh, to, to claim that when you have no power at all, that, that you know, that you're a saint, it's easy to claim that. You know, people will, will persecute you. They'll come and kill you. They'll, you know, they'll do all sorts of things to you. And you can say, all right, you know, I'm righteous. I, I never do anything wrong. But this vision of the Zionists is a vision of the, uh, the, the, the redemption of the souls, the Jewish souls of people who take responsibility who say, I understand that I may do something wrong, but I'm going to step forward and defend my people. I can't tell you. I mean, I just can't. I, I, it's, words don't express the, uh, the astonishing um, circumstance of having your sons, your sons and your nephews and, and everybody comes home for a Sabbath and we're all there together and we're hearing about what, what's going on in, in combat. And you know these these young young men. I also have a, a a niece who's in the canine corps. These young men and women, they're just everything that a Jew. I think that a Jew could want their kids to be. Their spirit is good. They know 
that their cause is ultimately just. They're unified with, with people who disagree with them politically and religiously. And more than anything else, they step forward to protect their parents. We live, there, live in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 50 miles, no more than 50 miles from the city of Gaza where, where uh, my, my, my kids and nephews are fighting. And the, the ability to look your son... My, my oldest son is a, uh, is a, he's a machine gunner. He has a, he carries this thing called a Negev. It's a very, very, very large weapon, which is used for, for covering fire. And, um, you know, he comes home and, and he says, I'm happy. I'm protecting my family. Right? This, this, this is, I think, for thousands of years, Jews couldn't say that. For thousands of years, Jews prayed for this. You may not know this, that the traditional Jewish prayers are, include um, uh, request for God to bring the people of Israel back home again and to restore us, as in the ancient times. These prayers are said three times a day. 1,000 times a year, traditional Jews, to this day, continue to pray for God to take us home. What is it that you're asking for? I mean, there's all sorts of interpretations. There's many different Judaism's views of this. But I'll tell you, I know what I'm asking for. I'm asking for children who can take responsibility for protecting their parents and their brothers and sisters and their children. For me, that's, that is the heart of Israeli nationalism. That's the heart of Jewish nationalism, is the... To me, to my mind, noble step of saying we're not going to hide behind our own innocence and weakness anymore. We're going to take responsibility. We, it, the Israeli Armed Forces doesn't request American uh, soldiers in Israel. It just, it's just an interesting historical and, and political fact. Notice that, that the Europeans have a treaty where, you know, the, the, there's a, uh, uh, the, 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 fi the fifth clause of the NATO treaty, which, in which, what does NATO say? NATO says, well, if we're in trouble, the Americans will come and save us. That's controversial today. I'm not going to get into that right now. But Israel has never said it as a matter of Israeli doctrine from the founding of the state. All the political parties have agreed to this. The purpose of the state of Israel is for Jews to defend themselves. What really happened in the Holocaust, the Zionists say, is the Jews were unable to defend themselves. The problem is not that the Americans didn't come to rescue us. The problem is that the Jews didn't come to rescue ourselves, our own families and children. And that, that we, all of us in Israel, feel is... A, a, a fundamental change in, in our lives that, that we take part in every day. Well, look, I've already said that, you know, I'm not going to claim that every Israeli uh, military or police action is necessarily just. We're, we're human. We make mistakes. But, uh, but I would like to just begin the conversation about Israel in the Middle East. Um, I, won't, I won't spend too much time on it. I'll, 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 I'll go to questions soon. But, but I just want to begin the conversation by thinking about the, you know, the issue that is always foremost in the minds of Americans and Europeans, not always, but most of the time. Whenever they think about Israel and they think about peace in the Middle East, the, the, there's, at this point, we're, we're deep in the habit of thinking, well, Look, you know, the question is, are the Israelis going to give the Palestinians a state? Okay, just for those of you who are not familiar with the geography, we're talking about uh, this famous territory between the river and the sea, between the Jordan, Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, that's, you know, 40, 50 miles wide. I mean, it's a, a tiny, tiny territory. And um, for 50 years at least, American statesmen have been investing great deals of a great deal of time trying to get uh, a compromise between 
uh, the Jews who live between the river and the sea and the Arab population that lives between the river and the sea, the, the Palestinian Arabs. I, I'm not going to, I, I, I don't want to present some kind of simplistic um, argument for how right we are and how wrong they are. Uh, instead, I think the right way to think about it is that part of, ex you, you remember at the beginning I said that there's a price for nationalism. Nationalism is not, it's not like some utopian ideal that just solves all problems. If there were an empire running the Middle East, then you know, the Jews wouldn't have a state and the Arabs wouldn't have a state. You know, it, it, somebody would be running the show, the Ottomans or the British or, or you know, whoever. But in a world of independent states where, where a people like the Jews, the Kurds, to, to name you know, a people without a state, 30 million people in the Middle East who freely deserve a state, I think. The people who assert their, um, their right, their dignity to, to have an independent country, to chart their own course, to find their own way to God, different from other people, these people necessarily cause harm to other people. You can't, you, you can't avoid it. I, I really don't, I, it's important to understand that, that most of the Zionists are not utopians. They're, they're people who understand that, that there's a price to be paid. We pay a price, other people pay a price for this national freedom. Now, as you know, Israeli politics has been divided for, for decades between those people who believe that a Palestinian state in that 50 miles between the river and the sea, in addition to Israel, that that's the right thing to do. Prudentially, morally, that it's the right thing to do and Israel needs to take great risks to do that. Um, I, I, I've, I've never been on that side, not because I don't think that you know, it's a nice ideal, but because in practice I don't think it's possible. I've, I've, never, I've never thought that it could be pulled off. But that divide in Israel has um, undergone a, a very great um, recalibration since the Oslo Accords. In 1993, uh, Prime Minister Rabin signed an agreement with Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestinian, Palestinian Liberation Organization, Palestine Liberation Organization, and that that signature was a signature to bring tens of thousands of armed Palestinian fighters. We Israelis considered them terrorists because, the, because they, of their habit of, of attacking civilians. But you can see it a different way if you want. The deal was bring in tens of thousands of PLO into different parts of that territory between the river and the sea. And in exchange for us, for the Jews, taking, making this grand gesture of allowing them to get on the road to an independent state, they would stop their warring with us. Now, as you know, um, that's not the way the story went. Um, in 2001, my wife and I were living in, in, uh, in Jerusalem at the time. In 2001, after the signing of this peace agreement with the Palestinians, we, there were, f from 2001 to 2005, four years of daily suicide bombings in our streets, in our cafes, on our buses. Now, I want to make it clear that what I just said is not intended, you know, just to be like a poetic rhetorical flourish, and, it, and it's okay to exaggerate because it's poetry or something. I'm talking about literally that we lived for three or four years with bombs, suicide bombs, on our buses and in our cafes five or six days a week of every week. That means we put our children on, on buses to go to school and we didn't know if they were gonna come home, okay? At the end of this, uh, Ariel Sharon was prime minister and I, I remember this very well. Um, he, he decided the Israeli army is gonna take apart the Palestinian army he invaded Ramallah, he invaded Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Um, my wife and I 
walked down to a, a hill overlooking Bethlehem, right next to our house in Jerusalem, and we sat there holding hands, and we watched the columns of Israeli armor entering Bethlehem and reconquering it. This is, you know, a, a few hundred yards from our house. The, from Bethlehem, the Palestinians had been machine gunning Gilo, which is part of Jerusalem, for six months. We had helicopters patrolling above our house for six months, every night, all night. Okay, and I'm not saying, you know, take pity on me. I'm not saying anything like that at all. I'm saying we decided to move to Israel. We decided that we're Zionists and we want to be a part of the Jewish people returning to take responsibility for its history. Part of that responsibility was that we elected leaders who made what I thought at the time was this mistake of bringing these, the, the, these armed groups into Israel. And Sharon took responsibility for putting an end to it. Did that harm innocent people? Sure. Innocent Jews were harmed for years and innocent Arabs were harmed during, during the, the, the counter invasion. Still, I think that it's the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing for the Jews to do. I think it's the right thing for the Jews to continue trying to make peace with their Arab neighbors. And I think it's the right thing for Jews to, at a certain point, say, a thousand people have been blown to bits, that's it, we're done. Now, now we're putting an end to it by force. We're taking responsibility. Ever since then, 2001 to 2005, that's called the Second Intifada, ever since then, there has been a, um, a, a disintegration of the Israeli peace camp. You can just track it, election after election. The political party, the Labor Party, which founded the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, you know, the, one of the great Jewish leaders in all, all Jewish history, who founded the Labor Party, that Labor Party has been annihilated electorally because it signed the Oslo Accords, because of those thousand people who were blown to bits on those buses and in those cafes. There, there's virtually no Labor Party in Israel anymore. It used to be the, the dominant party in the country. And Israelis after that um, became closer to one another. The extremes of the right and the left got smaller. The center got larger. But now we have, um, after a few years of, of very difficult internal politics, I can discuss it if you're interested, but I want to wrap up. After a few years of very difficult internal politics, we have this uh, inconceivable development that our armed forces, that I was just you know, talking about, you know, people make mistakes. Well, sometimes they make you know, mistakes, and sometimes they they make catastrophes. On October 7th, October 8th, we have 1,000 Israeli civilians who were murdered, burned alive, dismembered, raped, raped to death, carried into captivity. And I'm not trying to tell you that war is nice or that everything that we do in war is the right thing. But I am telling you this, that the whole purpose of the state of Israel in the minds of across the political spectrum, the whole purpose of the state of Israel is on the one hand to prevent this kind of thing from happening ever again. Well, we failed at that. And on the other hand, to make sure that if something like this happens, that the other side is going to pay a price so high that they won't want to do it again. And I, I understand. I understand the arguments. Oh, it's a cycle of violence. It's Hatfields and McCoys. It's, it, it's all true. But the choice that you make when you decide to, and, and by the way, this is the choice that Americans made when they decided to declare independence and, and fight their British brothers. The choice that you make when you say, we, we're, we're going to take this inheritance and we are going to establish an independent Jewish nation, we're going to defend it ourselves. That means that you also take responsibility for very, very difficult decisions like uh, the current war in Gaza. And just in case you're wondering how's the peace camp doing, 
um, the last poll I saw has 74% of Israelis opposed to a Palestinian state. Now, why? Well, you can think something else, but I'm going to tell you what they think. They think in 2005, as part of the Oslo Accords, we pulled out all the Israeli soldiers from Gaza. We pulled out the, the, every Jewish uh, community, every Jewish, every synagogue, every home. There were thousands of Jews living in Gaza. We pulled them all out. We bulldozed their ho homes. We pulled them all out. We created an independent state, Palestinian state of Gaza, and they were independent for 18 years. Okay, and I, I know all the arguments. No, it's not exactly independent. It, it doesn't matter. Israel bulldozed the homes of all the Jews living there, pulled them out, pulled the soldiers out, and for 18 years we got to see what a Palestinian state could look like. And what does it look like? Well, the first thing that happened is that the Americans really wanted elections. So in 2006, there were elections. And who won the elections? The Hamas won the elections. By the way, they didn't just win in Gaza, they also won in the West Bank. Now, all of a sudden, the Americans, wait a second, aren't the, aren't the Hamas, they're the ones who explicitly, constantly call for the murder of all the Jews, not the ones who, you know, try to soften it to make it, these are the, the ones who just explicitly say it, our goal is to murder all the Jews in the world. So the Americans, like, like scrambled a little bit to try to, to, to create a unity government, that Hamas shouldn't just be, you know, given the government of Gaza because they won the election. So they tried to create a unity government. By 2007, the Hamas felt strong enough. They just murdered all of the Fatah people, like hundreds of, of their, their co-Palestinians. They got rid of them. And then we had 16 years of the Hamas in Gaza. And I have to tell you, Israelis have had it. The Israelis who've had it are not people like me. I was always skeptical. I was always against this stuff. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all those lovely kibbutznikim, the, you know, those aging farmers on the, on the border of Gaza, who, who, who are like, you know, carrying on uh, uh, correspondences with, with, with Palestinian artists in Gaza about, and doing joint exhibitions and, and, and holding peace festivals. You know that, that the Nova Music Festival, why was it on, on the Gaza? a border, for God's sake. It was there because it was a peace festival. The, these kids thought that they were sending peace signals to the Palestinians who then came across the border and, and raped and murdered them. Israelis have had enough. It's going to be a very, very long time before anybody in Israel is, is, is willing to talk about a Palestinian state again. And this war is not over. It's not even close to over. We have other fronts that we have to deal with. Israel at, at the moment is, is in lower or higher degrees of combat on seven different fronts. Fr from Iran down to, the, to, to Yemen in the re at the bottom of the Red Sea to Gaza, the West Bank, the Lebanese border, the Golan, Israel is at war on all sides. This is going to go on apparently for a very long time. And when Americans say, you know, this is a very good opportunity for a Palestinian state, I'm proud of the Israeli public. I'm proud. I'm, I'm sorry if it sounds unfeeling. I'm proud of the Israeli public that they've finally gotten to the point where they say, look, enough. We've given enough. We can't give anymore. Anyway, that's a snapshot of... Zionism and Israeli nationalism as of right now. I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts and questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, uh, if you uh, came in late or forgot, the QR code here, if you want to submit a question, just take a photo with that, and you can uh, submit a question through Google Forums. 
Um, there are a lot of questions. I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. In fact, I'm going to skip some of my own here and just get to um, some more that's, that were submitted uh, during registration. Uh, Yoram, what is your ideal future for Gaza after the Hamas war? Can you hear me? Does this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, look, the, the, the Prime Minister Netanyahu um, speaks for the overwhelming majority of Israelis, uh, and he speaks for me as well. When, when he defines his war aims, <clears throat> they are, number one, the, uh, the complete destruction of Hamas. Uh, number two, the return of the hostages. Uh, in, in Israel, nobody comments on whether they're going to be returning alive or dead because we don't know. Uh, and number three, creating a political situation in Gaza which um, will prevent any such um, military invasion from there again, ever. That, that, that's the way that Netanyahu and his, uh, his government have described the, the war aims. Um, the, recently, the Israeli government has added, in response to American and European calls for a, you know, a Palestinian state to be established, I, I, I think I mentioned that Israelis don't like this idea. And um, so Netanyahu has added the following uh, description. He says that Israel is going to have full military control of Gaza, the West Bank, basically all the land from the river to the sea that we're arguing about, uh, because he doesn't think his public is going to be able to handle anything else. Um, so that prevents the establishment. I mean, if that happens, then there's not going to be a Palestinian, an independent Palestinian Arab state. Um, what's still possible is uh, the kinds of things that were discussed around the time of the Camp David Accords. Autonomy is possible. It's possible for uh, Palestinian Arabs to uh, step forward and take responsibility for their own education, for lo local government, for, uh, for um, uh, the, the administration of the territory and non-military issues. I'm a little bit skeptical. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be uh, a big mess for a long time because the, the population in, in Gaza, like the population in the West Bank, is overwhelmingly supportive of Hamas and its aims. Palestinian opinion polls just say this again and again. Um, so it looks like we are uh, moving in the direction of a civilian administration that is going to be opposed by the Hamas and the PLO. Um, that doesn't uh, d doesn't lead me to be too hopeful. So let me just say one hopeful thing. Um, during the last few years, Israel has signed peace treaties with five Arab nations, with uh, the Gulf states and Morocco and, and, and Sudan. Most of the Arab world wants peace with Israel. I mean, really wants peace with Israel. It's... Um, uh, you know, it's too bad that it's not just out of the kindness of their hearts. It's too bad that it's because they're scared of the Iranian menace, uh, which threatens all their countries. But you know what? These joint interests could create a very, very solid um, military and, uh, uh, and um, economic collaboration between Israel and the Arab world. And I think that they are, that the Arab world is tired of letting Hamas and the PLO have a veto over whether there's peace in the Middle East. So I think that that does open up a path to a better future. Yoram, do you think anti-Zionism is inherently anti-Semitic? Great question. You, you know, I, I really wish that I, I knew who was asking it, because <laughs> great question. Thank you. <laughs> Look. Um, f first of all, at one level, the answer is obviously no. Um, th there were lots of good Jews who, you know, in the 19, um, uh, in the 1890s, in the 1920s and 30s, all the way up to 1942 when the Holocaust broke, there were many, many prominent Jews 
who oppose the idea of a Jewish state. Um, it, pe people are familiar with the fact that there, you know, some Hasidic sects that opposed it, but the the really serious opposition came from the liberal Jewish left. Um, you know, famous thinkers like you know uh, Martin Buber and Yuda Magnus and Gershom Sholem and and uh, Albert Einstein, like all of these famous famous liberal Jews, um, who for for decades were opposed to having a Jewish state. And the idea that you know that you would call any of them anti-Semitic is absurd. And so, at one level, it's just ridiculous to say that anti-Zionism is the same as anti-Semitism. On the other hand, all of those people, all of those liberal Jews and, and, and their liberal friends who weren't Jews, all of them were talking about a theoretical future situation in which there was no state of Israel. Okay, And there's a, a difference between what a person means when he or she is saying, look, I think establishing the state of Israel would be a bad idea, so I'm an anti-Zionist. It hasn't happened yet. Let's try to you know, find some other solution. There's a difference between that and somebody who says, well, there's 7 million Jews living in Israel. I'm an anti-Zionist. I, I, I think Palestine should be freed. Like, they, they should all go home, or they should all be killed, or you know, they should all go to Poland, or what, whatever it is that people are saying when they are saying, today, I'm an anti-Zionist, there's a pretty good chance that if you're not just saying this in passing, but you, you have thought about it, and you really think that, some, that, that the seven million people living in the state of Israel shouldn't be there and that practical steps should be taken to drive them out or to make sure that, you know, that there's no Jewish state a few years from now, there's a really, really good chance that if you're saying that, then you probably actually are an anti-Semite. So um, I think one of the shocking things that's happened in, on the Jewish left in America, among liberal Jews, most, most Jews in America are, are liberal, um, those who are, you know, sort of conservative, rightist kind of people like me, it's like 20% or something. But 80% of Jews in America are liberal. And they, um, after October 7th, and, and for, for decades, for years, these liberal Jews have been uh, hanging out with, you know, liberal non-Jews um, and and accepting the friendship of, um, of Arabs, Muslims, uh, you know, all sorts, of, all sorts of people, some of them good people, some of them less good people, who were saying, I'm not, I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm an anti-Zionist, right? It's, I, I shouldn't just say, you know, Arabs and Muslims. I mean, there, there's an entire neo-Marxist left that is uh, homegrown in the United States and it features many, many people who've been saying for decades, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. And most Jews bought it. Most Jews defended this distinction. And after October 7th, this distinction has collapsed in the minds of most Jews. Why did it collapse? Because the whole time when people were hearing Left, lefty academics and, uh, and, and, and Muslim friends saying, uh, I'm an anti-Zionist, not an anti-Semite. What they thought they were hearing was, let's divide the land. Let's come up with peace. Let's, let, let, let's have a liberal peace. Let's, you know, some of the land will go to Jews, some will go to, to Arabs. We can solve this problem. But the week after October 7th, on October 8th and October 9th, liberal Jews started discovering that their friends, especially the academics, but all sorts of people, but a lot of their friends were organizing teach-ins to explain why the massacre of Israeli civilians, the rape of Israeli civilians, their dismemberment, their being taken hostage, why all of this was justified. 
And, and the Hamas is you know, declaring, we'll, we'll, we're gonna keep doing this, we're gonna do it over and over again until we, until we reach all Jews in the world. And all of a sudden, these liberal Jews heard their friends who they thought would be saying, Oh my gosh! You know, I, I I support an independent Palestinian Arab state, but you know, but I never thought that you know that this kind of Nazi-like butchery of civilians and children, and that I never believed something that that would happen. This is what liberal Jews thought that their that their lefty friends were going to say, and that's not what they said. They organized all these teachings to explain why the whole thing was justified, and there is a tremendous shock that is is continues to ripple through the American. Jewish community, I, I don't know where it's going to end, but much of the Jewish leadership in America no longer believes there's a distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. I warned you I was going to ask some critical questions, so here's one that was submitted. Um, how can you defend the genocide and ethnic cleansing being committed against Palestinian people by Israel? Well, I, I suppose you all, you, you, you all know that I don't think that question is framed especially well. Um, look, again, um, when we're talking about the establishment of a Jewish nation state, the national state of the Jewish people, we're talking about um, harnessing I mean, th this is exactly what the what the liberal Jewish anti-Zionists, Hermann Cohen, Franz Rosenzweig, Hannah Arendt. This is exactly this is what they were objecting to. They were saying Judaism should remain like a pure, powerless, intellectual, spiritual thing. You, you you'll destroy Judaism if you harness an army to it, a police force. You 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 can't take Judaism and turn it into something that that has that wields power, that wields deadly power. So that's what they were saying. And um, and I think all of those anti-Zionists, the, the famous liberal Jewish anti-Zionists, I think that all of them would have agreed with the following statement, even though they didn't think Jews should go that way. I think they all would have agreed that two million German civilians were killed by the Allies during World War II. But I, you know, I'm just not familiar. Maybe I'm just traveling the wrong circles. I'm not familiar with anybody who says that the reason that the Allies killed two million Germans was because their purpose was to exterminate the German people and to to commit genocide. Like the, the I think normal people can distinguish between the Nazis held a conference in Wannsee, they they sat and planned the murder of all the Jews in the world. And, and this, this extermination was, was their goal. All of, those, all of those Jews were civilians. They weren't threatening Germany in any way. I think most normal people can distinguish between that and the allies who were attacked by the Germans. And in order to defend themselves, Maybe they made some mistakes. I'm not saying that they're perfect. But in, as part of defending themselves, they killed 2 million German civilians. This is on top of 5 million German soldiers. OK, so look, I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe there's any genocide going on in, uh, in Israel right now. The only calls for genocide that I'm familiar with are coming from the Hamas. But. I also have, you should remember, I have my kids, my nephews and nieces, the children of my friends, they're in my house all the time. We talk about what's happening on the war. None of these soldiers have ever been told by one of their commanders, there's some you know, Arab civilians over there, go kill them. This doesn't exist in the Israeli military. There's nothing like that. So. I'm sorry about every life lost, but I, I also think Israel doesn't have much choice. Um, it has to fight this war. That means there will be civilian deaths, and uh, it's it's regrettable, but I think it is the right thing to do, and to call it genocide is simply to smear people who are fundamentally just and trying to defend themselves. I want to pivot <clears throat> briefly to... Uh the university, uh, so I'm a 
uh, philosophy professor, you you did your uh, PhD at a public university in the U.S. Uh, on December 5th, 2023, then president of Harvard, uh, Claudine Gay, was called to testify before Congress. Uh, in a recent piece that you wrote for Public Discourse, you write, quote, when asked whether calling for the extermination of Jews was an infraction of Harvard's standards of conduct for faculty and students, Gay replied that, quote, we embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful, end quote. So I want to ask you, what should President Gay have said? Uh, I, I think the President Gay should have said, uh, we have a wide variety of uh, views that are expressed by um, by, ac by professors at our university, by students at our university, by visiting graduate students from foreign countries, and uh, we cherish freedom of expression. But there is a minimum standard of decency that we require of all members of our community. We don't expect our professors or our students to call for the, uh, the murder of blacks, the, the, the massacre, the annihilation of blacks because they're blacks. We don't expect them to, to call for the destruction, the physical destruction of gay people. And we also don't accept them if any professor or student is calling for the abolition of whiteness meaning the destruction of uh, white people in America, or for the destruction of Israel, meaning the destruction of seven million Jews, we also don't accept that. I think that um, that kind of standard, the one that I just expressed, is not, it's not a fantasy. When I was a student in the 1980s, that was, that was in fact, those were the we had boundaries for free speech. I, I was on the debate team. I, I coached debate. I taught, taught students how to, how to give honor to other sides. We always had boundaries to what was considered to be legitimate speech in debates on campus. You, if, you, um, if you thought you were going to, for some reason to de defend the Holocaust, or Stalin's liquidation of, of, of the Kulaks, or Pol Pot's extermination of two million Cambodians, if, if, if that was your idea, nobody would have let you say it. The, 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 the students themselves would simply have booed you off the stage. There was no free speech for defending the Holocaust in the, at Princeton in the 1980s. By the way, it's not just murder. If, no, no one thought that you were allowed to uh, to call for, you know, for raping women. It was considered uh, indefensible, something that nobody, would, nobody could defend, and it was, uh, it was off limits. Or, or sadistic torture. I'm not talking about the debate about, you know, um, uh, uh, torturing terrorists w w when, when it might save lives. I'm talking about just the question of taking pleasure in, in torturing people, taking pleasure in torturing animals, uh, the, the, the murder of, 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 of weak people, whether they're you know, children or the elderly, all of these things were, were completely off limits. And somehow we've moved into a world where academia thinks that, you know, it's, of course people should be able to call for the extermination of the Jews as long as they make good arguments for it. And I, you know, I, I just, I think that the university that has taken free speech, which is a, a crucial and important principle, it's taken that principle so far that, 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 that you can't even recognize it anymore. It's, it, it, it's just dehumanizing where they've taken it. Right now, not only President, the former President Claudine Gay and her neo-Marxist friends, not only them, but also the, the anti-Marxist liberal professors and some of the conservative professors who are speaking out, they're all saying something like, we need absolute free speech. We need the university to be, to be a neutral forum. People should, if, if people are calling for the extermination of the Jews or the blacks or the whites or the Christians, then 
that should be allowed, and, and we should uh, you know, just make good arguments against it. I say this is preposterous. You cannot run an educational institution in which everybody is free to beat the drums for mass murder of the other kinds of people who are on the campus whenever they feel like it. That's the end of education. The minimum of education is to place boundaries, common decency. It, it, we, we used to have it. We could, in theory, have it again. I want to stay on the topic of the university. In your view, what is the biggest problem with the contemporary American university? <laughs> You're asking me? Yes. Sorry. Uh, what is the biggest problem with the contemporary American university? The biggest problem with the contemporary American university is that since the late 1960s, the universities have been systematically, and, and they, were, they were run by, by good liberals, they've been systematically creating uh, faculty positions, entire departments to advance neo-Marxist worldviews while systematically eliminating conservative professors from the campuses. That's the problem. All right. You become president of an American university. What changes do you make? Okay. Okay, look. <laughs> the American universities only pretend to be independent of, of one another, to be independent institutions. They're not actually independent. Um, the, there is a system of peer review that operates at every level, at every single level of academia. If, if you want to publish a 6,000 word uh, article on something, it's peer reviewed by, by, by people from across academia. If you want to uh, advance a doctoral student to, to get a doctorate, that doctoral student is being peer reviewed by people from, from outside of his department. If you think that your department is a good department, Every 10 years, it gets peer reviewed by, by accrediting bodies that come and tell you, no, you, you don't have a good department. Here's what the changes you need to make in order to keep accreditation, and, and, and I could go on and on. There is a, a, a vast um, system of homogenization which puts, which, which stifles any kind of dissenting thought in virtually every discipline that you can name, including, including in the sciences. And if I were president, I mean, nobody's going to take me up on this, fortunately, so I can go wild, right? If, if I were president of an American university, I would say this university is declaring independence from the universal left-wing academic cartel. We are not going to ask for or take peer review from other institutions. We are going to auto-accredit. Our institution, we have, we have great professors. They're capable of accrediting uh, and, and granting doctorates and, 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 and agreeing to publication and advancement of intellectually sound people of diverse worldview. We are going to do this independently of the entire rest of the system. I, as the president, I, I've asked my trustees to change the constitution of the university so that from now on, I as the president can appoint, directly appoint heads of departments and those heads of departments are going to be responsible for making sure that these departments are uh, creative, that they're interesting, that they're diverse, that they're intellectually sound, that original things are taking place, that they are not bucking under the, you know, the, the neo-Marxist revolution. And if I see that I've appointed someone to head some department who's incapable of doing that, then I'm going to re remove that head of the department and replace him with, with a, a, uh, a scholar, a man or a woman who is capable of doing that job. I want to return to Israel. Um, how would you respond to someone who says that Israel is a settler colonial state? Well, look, I think that the Jews are the indigenous population of the land that we're talking about. 
I, I, I do. I think the, that if you were a scholar and you wanted to investigate it impartially, that that's what you would conclude. You would conclude that the, the, the Canaanites uh, ceased to exist historically thousands of years ago and that the Philistine, Philistines ceased to exist historically thousands of years ago and that the only people that that you know that has a a historical bond going back thousands of years to that land are are the Jews. Now I don't expect everybody to agree with me about this, obviously, but that is what I believe. Uh, and so, since the people saying that I'm a settler colonialist because I've returned to the land of my ancestors since they know that I think I'm returning to the land of my ancestors. I mean, they may think that this is complete nonsense and it's made up, but they know I believe it. So since they know that, they, that I believe it and 7 million other Israelis believe it, since they know that, I think that this is another um, uh, uh, manipulative um, m maneuver because, because if you're saying, look, the Jews have a good claim, the Arabs have a good claim, other people have a good claim, let's divide the land, you know, maybe that's not practical, but at least it's, you know, it has some justice to it. What justice is there to saying that millions of Jews who, who for thousands of years have prayed three times a day to return to the land, that they're settler colonialists? I mean, it, to me, it doesn't, doesn't work. As a philosopher, do you have thoughts on what seems like fashionable rhetorical on a uh, fashionable rhetorical tactic of the progressive left, namely redefining terms to suit their ideological prejudices? We saw this happen with racism and violence over the past few years. Now apartheid and even genocide have been given new meanings, which are seemingly reverse engineered to disparage Israel. This is especially ironic considering that Hamas's founding charter is overtly genocidal. Is argument even possible in the face of such, such tendentious redefinition? Look, that, this, is, this is a, a very good question. It goes back to, um, to the, the essay you were quoting before of mine about um, creating a sphere, what you need to do in order to have a sphere of free speech uh, at a university or, or really anywhere. I think that the key, the key to a sphere of free speech is that you give honor to all the individuals and all the factions, all the movements within that sphere and they give honor back to you. When I say give honor, I mean that when they start speaking, you listen. You listen carefully. You give them their allotted time, and then you stand up. You thank them for the speech that they gave, even though it hurts you and you disagree with it. You thank them, and you 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 praise them for their for their frankness and for their willingness to enter into a discussion. And then you respond to their arguments with arguments. That these things I just described. This is the minimum requirement to have a functioning sphere of free speech. The moment that somebody on the other side is um, no longer honoring you, right? The moment that you know this gentlewoman over here earlier this evening, she she's unwilling to honor my views. The moment she's not willing to honor my views, we're not in the sphere of free speech anymore. We're in the sphere of abuse, and and the the goal of those elements on campus, both professors and students, the goal is to abuse, to intimidate, to silence other people's views, to, and, and then to capture, you know, with the help of the, the, the administration, to, to accuse of, of, of thought crimes and speech crimes and, and, and act, all sorts of violations of things to accuse people who are simply trying in, a, in the traditional way to express their opinions. So they're relying on administrators to shut up the people who are trying to maintain the tradition of free speech while they themselves are immune 
to, to accusations. I, 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 I've personally seen this in recent weeks, that, that if you're uh, Jewish or if you're white and, you're, and, and, and you respond to these accusations by filing accusations of your own, guess what? Your accusations are thrown out. They're not even considered. Right, so we're, we're looking at a situation in which we have to admit this. If, um, if we're dealing with a group of people who are willing to honor my views and accept my honoring them, then I, I'm, I'm willing to hear them make arguments that are extremely difficult and extremely painful for me. But if they're not willing to honor me, and they're not asking to be honored. If they're, they're asking to steamroller, they, they have no place in, in a sphere of free speech because that's not what they're about. They're not even trying to do that. All they're trying to do is to capture the good name of the university, its financial resources, its, uh, its capacity to credential and send out into the world generations of future generations of people who agree with them. That's not free speech. That has nothing to do with free speech. It's, it, it, it's sim simply conquest. I am a Palestinian in exile. Do you think I should have the right to return to my ancestral homeland? Wow, this is a complicated question. Um, look, I, I don't... Um, if you, t if you happen to take a look on my book on nationalism, you'll see that I try very hard to um, not turn nationalism into some kind of utopian fantasy of like how everyone on earth could simultaneously have an independent state and everybody would live in peace. I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible. Just to give you an obvious example, there's close to 2,000 different languages spoken in India. Every single one of those language groups, I mean, every one of them could, could declare, I have a right, I have an independent culture, and I, I'm being oppressed by the, the general culture, and I have a right to an independent state. Now, obviously, there's no way to run the world that way. And some friends, some, some people who I respect, they say, Yoram, the argument you just made is the reason why we need you know, world empire, because, because there is no way to, to justly solve the problem of who gets an independent state and who's part of somebody else's independent state. And who, it, it is a difficult problem. Um, but I nevertheless, I, I wrote in my book, I believe the Kurds should have a state. I, th I think they really deserve a state. They really need a state. They have a tradition going back to the Medes. It, 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 it's clearly a people that's, that, that it is oppressed and has a, a, a brilliant history, and I support it. On the other hand, I went to Scotland a few years ago, and, um, and you know, I had seen Braveheart like several times, and I was like, Scottish independence, I'm there. You know, that was how, how I felt when I got there. And I spent a few weeks, um, in, you know, just asking everybody that I could, um, you know, the professors and the, the people running the, the restaurants and the, 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 the people with the tourist attraction. I just, I just talked to everybody I could about Scottish independence. And basically what I heard from them is, well, we don't like the English, and, um, and so we want to be part of the European Union. And I would say something like, wait, so you want to dismantle, uh, you know, 400 years of, of a s extraordinary collaboration between the Scots and the, the, the English in order to be a pawn in, in a German-run organization? Like, that, 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 that's what you're telling me? And, and they would say things like, you know... I know that the Germans are going to own us. I know it. I know it. But the British, you know, the, the English, they're just, it, you can't stand them. And I, you know, I just walked out of that, and I, I, I just felt like I have no sympathy for Scottish nationalism. They should just stay part of Britain. So, look, these, th these things are really complicated. So now I'm going to say something complicated about Palestinians. Um, 
the the what I'm about to say, I I in no way mean to say that um, that individuals who feel a strong loyalty to Palestinian Arab nationalism that there's anything illegitimate about their feeling it. I I I respect it. I understand it. I I don't have a complaint about it. But I do think that um, that if you ask the question. What really are the cultural differences, if any, between people who are now called Palestinian Arabs and the overwhelming majority of the, the, the Arab population in Jordan or the Sunni population in, uh, in Syria? These countries didn't exist before 100 years ago. There, 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 was, there was no difference between Syria and Israel and Lebanon and Jordan. These, 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 these countries were created by the British and the French and the, after World War I. And so I, I think that a, a reasonable person who is not personally committed you know, for family reasons and historical reasons, to uh, to Palestinian nationalism, should be a little skeptical about this. They're not the Kurds. They're not even the Scots. It's it it's basically a subgroup within within Sunni Arabs of of the Levant. Why really do they need another country? I'll just leave you with that question. With my apologies to the. Sorry, we're out of time. Yeah, I'm. Th there will be time after to speak. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, she's been so she's been so patient. Oh, sorry. I, I just okay. I just I just don't want to make exceptions for everyone who is begging to ask their own question. Okay, so with with apologies to the forty or more others who um, whose questions I didn't get to ask, uh, let me just ask you this uh, last question, Yorm. What gives you hope? What What gives me hope? I, my 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 children give me hope. That I, I have, Yael and I have. We have we have nine children. We just had our fifth grandchild, and um, and uh, wow, they're so the. They are, they're so beautiful, and they're so idealistic, and they're so practical, and they're so kind. And I just, I, I got to believe they're going to do better, a better job than I did. On the behalf of the Benson Center, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight for this conversation. Uh, please join me in thanking Yoram Hazani. <laughs>